Greetings, community. I'm Candy Lewis, CEO of Positive Results Center. We address trauma from a cultural and age perspective, and we all know it is Domestic Violence Awareness Month. Let me give a, a quick shout out. It is also um, Breast Cancer Awareness Month, and there are a lot of people in our families and in our communities that are experiencing not only breast cancer, but other types of cancer. And that has also impacted my family. So I want to give um, just a little prayer to everyone to let you know that we are with you in thoughts and we are praying for your wholeness, your healing and full recovery. Now, back to the conversation of the day. Today, we are engaging men to prevent violence. We're going to have several conversations about men preventing violence, including men being victimized, uh, because we know for a fact that although the vast majority of violence is perpetrated by men, not all men are abusers, and that there are women that are abusers as well. So let me just go ahead and roll this conversation. First, I'm going to um, introduce my team. I'd like to start with Ashley. And Ashley is our Director of Operations. She's going to be greeting people, welcoming them in. We also have Crystal and Destiny. Crystal is going to be monitoring our chat. And if you have questions and you want to have conversation, please put those conversation, those questions in the chat. Feel free to um, put your reactions in the chat, to put your comments in the chat, to share who you are and what agencies you're with, because we believe in collaborations and partnership. Um, so on that note, we I want to just, when I tell you these men, these men are so dynamic. I am so thankful and grateful uh, for them. So by um, spelling, we're going to start with Barry. I'm going to introduce them all, just say their name, and I would like them to tell you a little bit about who they are and the organizations they're with. They're going to spend about a minute, two minutes. So Barry, go ahead. Barry Axius, founder of Voice of the Youth, CEO, community advocate here in Sacramento. Uh, Voice of the Youth is a mentor leadership uh, program, a community base. We work with our young kids from 12 to 25, as well as supporting our communities um, and every walk of life and, and every capacity. You know, we just had a huge, tremendous win. Let's give a big hand clap because with our efforts, with our She Could Be she could uh, be My Daughter program, we helped get that Ebony Alert signed. It's documented. It will be law in January. That's called advocacy. Shots out to all the team and shots out to all the folks doing the work. Um, no longer will our missing Black girls um, be seen, not in the sense of urgency as they need, but uh, they're going to be looked like um, Amber as well. So in the same uh, frame, you know, we're out here um, taking political stances. We're out here um, serving our community. We have a big shoe drive that we're going to be doing October 15th, um, giving about 600 shoes, our Fresh Kick for Kids programming. That's one of our many programs that we do outside of the youth programs that we have. So we are an all in all, um, you know, inside of our community with community violence. So much of the stuff that we touched on, but um, you know, just a huge win for California as the Ebony Alert um, will be in law uh, January 1st, 2024. We're excited about that. The efforts of Bradford and his um, team, as well as the groundwork that we've done uh, just to advocate for missing Black girls. As so many of us know, that money of our Black girls get exploited. And with that being said, um, you know, in Sacramento, it's a hub here uh, for sex trafficking. So just for us to get a little bit of that accountability uh, keeps on proving to me that the work doesn't go unseen. Um, when we were doing the She Could Be My Daughter program, we really didn't think that it would um, do anything, but just kind of, again, put some awareness when our missing girls were out here in Sacramento or things were happening. But to now see that actually transfer or transformation in law, um, it's a beautiful thing. So, you know, um, I'm excited and I'm ready for this conversation. Thank you, Barry. That is really huge. I want to talk a little bit more about the Ebony Law as we um, continue this conversation. But right now, I'd like to introduce you to, you know, I never pronounce your name right. 
<laughs> so introduce your full name for us. I am, uh, my, my name is Refugio Rodriguez. Um, I go by Cuco. Um, I'm actually named after my mother. So I'm, technically I'm a junior, uh, but but uh, Cuco is a uh, demuted. It's a Robert kind of Dick kind of thing or Bob and Robert kind of thing. So Cuco is short in Mexico for Refugio. So uh, it means actually shelter or refuge, but uh, uh, it's a longer story about my name. But in any way, in, 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 in any um Thank you for for uh, inviting me, Candy. I really appreciate being part of this conversation. This is a big part of my work uh, prior to arriving at Hope and Heal. Uh, I currently am the strategist and chief equity officer for the Hope and Heal Fund, and we are a fund that focuses primarily on reducing gun violence in the state of California. And by that, I mean we focus on reducing uh, issues related to homicides, including uh, intimate partner violence homicides, mass shootings, as well as suicides. And it also includes uh, officer-involved shootings, law enforcement or government sanction uh, uh, shootings, especially of people of color. Big emphasis of, of ours is on equity and gun violence. Certainly, it shows up in the way that our lives are valued or devalued uh, in systems. So for us, that's a big part of our work. Um, but I'll I'll stop there. It's wonderful to be uh, be here with all of you, and looking forward to the conversation. Kuko, thank you so much. I didn't realize that about your name. Thank you for sharing that. And let me tell you that all of our presenters are so fabulous, and their organizations are. We're going to talk a little bit more about how the the interaction, the intersections of each one of their organizations, as well as the community work is important to preventing and ending violence. So next, I'm going to introduce my longest partner in this game, Mr. Terry. Terry, come on and join us. Well, Candy, I got my camera hooked up, so I'm glad you got my text. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. My name is Terry Boykins, um, CEO of Street Positive and also Executive Director of Project Finding Chance. Um, my main focus has been on working with men who have experienced childhood trauma, uh, particularly in abuse, that has affected them not only emotionally, but financially over the lifespan. And how that abuse and impact has, you know, unfortunately um, wrecked havoc on their relationship with their children, uh, as well as their intimate partner uh, and, you know, family. Uh, that's one component. Uh, the other component um, is I've spent about two or more decades, actually more than two decades in CDCR, uh, particularly working with life without parole populations that have been incarcerated um, for intimate partner violence. Uh, most of the populations that I have worked with uh, actually had committed crimes where they killed their intimate partner specifically in front of children. Um, and the impact of trauma uh, over the lifespan, once again, has been significant. Uh, I'm also currently the executive director of Product Fighting Chance, uh, which is a nationally recognized um, amateur boxing program. We are currently getting ready for uh, the Olympic trials uh, in Lafayette, Louisiana, to represent the United States and Paris, France. And so I'm honored to be here um, and to also talk about the impact of what happens when you create a champion who actually can use that particular anger and use that particular trauma to redirect it to achieve something great uh, in their lifelong goal. And which we are right now doing is helping individuals pursue their dream of being Olympic champions and representing the United States in the sport of boxing. So as you can see, community, this conversation is going to be lit. Uh, I, and thank you, Terry. Thank you, Barry. Thank you, Kiko, for being here. Um, so as I said earlier, this conversation is going to be real. We're going to have real talk conversation. And if you're not ready for it, you might as well get ready for it. Uh, I want to really start with something that you said, Terry, that was really important. Let's look at what happened to each person as they were a child, the abuse that they experienced as children and how that has manifested in their life as a father, as a husband, as a partner, or as a wife, or as a partner, uh, as a parent. 
Can you talk about each one of you talk a little bit about that and how that has um, how that has manifested in the work that you're doing, as well as with the people that you're working with? Well, Barry, I'll let you give us some love here, man. So, well, what you gonna throw me out there in the canister? Yeah, you know, since um, you're the only one to have a hat on, so I'm gonna let you give us some oh, love no, since that, you got the hat on. Well, my hair, I couldn't get my hair done in time, so you know, um, okay, all jokes aside, um, I think that you know, trauma plays a lot, a, a huge part in a lot of what we see when we talk about violence. You know, uh, a lot of the young people that I work with. You know their adverse childhood um, experiences um, have lot have really lotted and created um, some of the violence and some of the mechanism of how they, um, I believe, react to um, you know adversity in their lives, especially when it comes um, with women. Right, um, most of the times you have these young male figures that are not depositing um, positive um, deposits in their box as well as having a mother overcompensate because they don't have that strong male figure in the household, right? And in some forms, and a lot of times, the, the young male looks at the mother, um, whether that mother has sustained herself to be the breadwinner or that mother has had multiple um, boyfriends and those infractions of how those relationships end up being um, kind of plays a part, right? One In one end, you can have one young man that experienced watching his mother be abused, right, throughout the process. Um, and that by itself uh, creates that animosity where you would think that uh, most young males would probably look at it and be more protective, but it's almost as if they were, were revengeful at the person. Because in this same sense, crazy how it sounds, even though their mother might be abused, that relationship with that male, they might have connected. And when that male is no longer a part of that young person's life, right, giving that young person perspective, they feel um, a vendetta or they feel animosity towards their mother, right? They don't really see that happening, but it plays out into their relationship to where they feel they cannot trust a woman ever, right? And at the same particular time, when a male, I believe, is lacking in the household, and I'm talking about a strong male figure. We're not just talking about a crackerjack Negro that's just sitting around, just being a part of the couch. We're literally a person that wakes up, goes to work, that's due diligence is to show this young person what manhood looks like, um, what values are, uh, what's respectability, what's a, a, a common sense, What's discipline? When those core values aren't cemented to a young person, this young person, the way they'll react, they'll react by um, a lot of conversations that they'll have with their friends. They'll take on this persona from social media um, that plays a huge part in a lot of what is growing our young people to be as violent as they are, as well as um, in their neighborhoods. So a lot of the times they embolden what they see, but truly what I've seen is the lack there of male counterparts, positive males in our um, you know, communities have created some of these um, violent interactions when it comes to um, our counterparts, the female, because our young men are just not being growth in how to display behavior that's conducive to showing what a strong relationship look like. And that doesn't mean that mom, dad, or boyfriend, girlfriend have to be together, but was there a positive exchange in that um, relationship? You know, I'll jump in and, and uh, Barry, thanks for talking about the mother. And I, I have a chance to go across the street to the fathers in terms of the role that fathers play or they don't play uh, in the lives of their children in terms of coping mechanisms and skills. And you also have a chance to look at how children become children because it comes down to which women they have a chance to lay down with and have relationships with. And if that woman is not conscious of what relationship that man has with her father, um, she may be in for a big surprise mm. and sometimes more dangerous than she ever realizes. So you have to be very careful in who you sleep with, uh, which could result in creating a child. And so one of the things that I've had the opportunity to do, particularly is, is the amount of time I've spent in CDCR and a lot of individuals that are incarcerated that have children, um, where you look at these 
Barry, as you mentioned, the adverse childhood experiences and the ACEs, and but also what exactly is it that causes a man to become so angry where he would want to create violence? And this is something that is somewhat a phenomena in terms of the, you know, the genetics of the father. And I've dealt with a lot of men who were angry but had calm fathers, mm. only to find out that that father was not their biological father. Mm. So wow. you got to understand who you getting in bed with. And so he may have thought because that's the man that raised him. That's the mother that raised him. But genetically, there may be a disposition that he is very, very unaware of in that regard. And so this is one of the things when you talk about the role of a father and you talk about, you know, the circumstances and the impact that mothers have. But I would say that the issue of violence is, as once again, I've spent a lot of time with men in CDCR um, over the last two decades and pretty much every prison that California has um, basically erected. And it's about a number of things. We can go back to Cain and Abel in terms of where the first violence was created. Um, but this is where I think that when we talk about how we create children and who becomes the parents and what is wrong between the people who actually have relationships, since we're talking about Domestic Violence Awareness Month, we have to be very conscious of making sure that men understand what they're getting into and women understand who they're getting involved with. So before we go further, uh, I think that that's a really good point because let's be honest, most people were not having sex thinking about having children. They're thinking about getting an itch scratched, feeling right. good, looking at that man, that woman, and saying, yeah, I want to get busy with them. Yeah. We don't think about kids. That's an after fact. And I feel like that, holds a, that, that feels a, uh, it holds a lot of responsibility um, for both parties. But as I always tell my young bulls, we have the gold conversation. And the gold conversation is the magnum conversation. You know what I mean? Having that condom. I'm telling them, like, you know, at the end of the day, you don't want those problems. I first say, hey, don't have sex until you're prepared and you understand self, one, and understanding who your partner you're going to have sex with, right? That's two. But if you are, please don't allow yourself to trick yourself into thinking that I'm going to smash and dash and it's all going to be good. Or like some of my young bulls say, I'm going in raw. Um, no, <laughs> that like cut that. That's not that's not the mold. Because at the end of the day, when I watch and I hear so many, um, you know, hurt men, because when I watch social media or I'm listening to brothers, hurt men that had a partner and it goes backwards and it it goes awry. I asked them, I said, it was all pleasurable when you guys were making what you was making. And now that this responsibility, which is it's a baby's come out, now all of a sudden she's this, she's that, and the other, my brother, that's still your responsibility. I, I don't because when it comes to that, when it happens, I don't want any brother to back away from it. You got to meet it and lead it and figure it out because that becomes now your responsibility. I don't want to hear about, man, my baby mama, you tripping and she do. Listen, OK, because we all tripping. You know what I mean? You was tripping when you jumped in the bed with the baby mama that's tripping. Right. You now have to start figuring out, OK, I'm not going to be with this person. How do we figure out a way? to we can be able to co-parent, not for no one else, but that child. And my brothers, I I hate the simple fact that we don't take the responsibility of owning that part. Because I'm working with so many beautiful kids that call me uncle because they don't have an uncle or father, that call me dad or pops or, uh, 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 or I'm a father figure because they don't have that positive role model or have that father in their lives. I play that role and I'm looking at these gracious, beautiful kids that all, you know, have a, a, a little bit of ingredients that we got to put in every single one of them. And I ask myself, why would no man want to be a part of this? Why wouldn't someone want to be a part of the cultivation? I always go back to 
the mirror of looking at who that man truly was. And a lot of us hate these two words. These are the two biggest words that we hate in the black community. Let me give it to y'all. Accountability and responsibility. When you start saying those words, you start blending that up, oh, you're going to have niggas run around and, 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 and hide to the hills and to the mountains. Because you can see from the interaction, I guarantee you there's probably more women on this uh, conversation to listen than there are men. When there should be a lot more men, because we are the men, we are the people that need the tools. Because if it's truly about men leading the way, then we need to let, lead the way in all actions. And that's a responsibility of if things do happen, how do we now approach it moving forward? Yeah, and I'm going to jump in I, real quick. It, no, I, go, Mr. Rodriguez, oh. go ahead. Sorry, sorry, I was just wanted to add. You, you, you know, I, I, I appreciate where we're at and how we deal the realities of our communities. But from an equity standpoint, I always think it's important for us to contextualize how we got here, um, because you know, our, our, one of the things I like to tell people is, 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 is violence is prevalent in my community not because we are more or less violent than other people. Uh, violence is prevalent in our community because more violence has been perpetrated upon my community not for one generation, for multiple generations, yes. for 500 years. And so uh, it, don't blame me for the, the circumstances that created where we're at. It's the circumstances that we need to look at that. And part of that is institutional structures, it's racism, it's oppression. So all of these things. And I say all of that because I think that a, a lot of the conditions that we find ourselves battling against with young people, um, they didn't happen in a vacuum. You know, in my community, from my culture, there is no word from an indigenous standpoint. I'm from Mexico. My family's from Mexico. We had no word for sex. We had words for relationships, but there was no word for sex because sex did not exist outside of relationship. And so I point that out because for us, a lot of my work where it started, I started in reproductive health. And what we what we really realized is that those young men that were at the highest risk of being what they call unintended fathers were the same young men that we're talking about that were in, in, in they, they were marginalized and were in different systems probation cps you name it they were part of those systems uh, but but what we also discovered is that the underlying what was behind a lot of the the bravado the sexuality their behaviors is 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 you know was one of the saddest realizations for me, which was to work with a 15 year old who had no hope for anything. Mm. I mean, we really need to grapple with that. You're 15 and you don't see tomorrow. You don't see beyond tonight. And, and that's a very challenging issue to contend with, where what I see is you have your whole life ahead of you he was seeing, I, I I don't know if I'll make it tomorrow. So so decision making becomes very much in the moment. Sexuality, violence, all of these things become part of that equation. And I think we forget that because I point that out because I think that what we forget is that a lot of the behaviors are very much because what we're dealing with here is, is a sense of, of hopelessness and helplessness with young people. And, and I'm not a religious person, but I think I'm a spiritual person. But I feel like for me, a lot of my work was very much about giving people hope uh, to have them believe that there was a better opportunities. There was tomorrow for a lot of these young people. And I think it's very important because a lot of the decision making around violence, around all of these things is very short term thinking that, but, but again, I also want to contextualize it. It has been created in our communities and then we begin to normalize it as if it's part of a cultural trait when in reality is not. I go back to this. We are no more or less violent than any other group. The difference is we have we have endured a lot more violence and that does something to people. The last thing I'll say um, that I think is, it, 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 you know, along what, what Terry and, and Barry brought, brought up in terms of specifically to gender issues. Uh, I, I think that, that that the absence of of males in our communities um, has been an institutional practice in many places in this country that we haven't acknowledged, and it's had a significant impact. And I'll tell you, I work with men um, who were sexually abused, physically abused by their fathers, and they forgave them. 
you know what they never forgave and what i have what i have kind of concluded is the most violent act that can be perpetrated on a male and women too but men particularly is to be abandoned by their father mm. i have worked with men who are 80 years old and still struggle with reconciling the pain, the anger, the suffering of not having a father around. And, 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 and as a male, I'll tell you, I, I feel it. I, I, I grew up with a father. I have a father. I cannot fathom what my life would have been like without uh, the lessons and the teachings and the blessings that my father brought. And yes, he wasn't perfect and he made a lot of mistakes. But at the other side of that, there were a lot of teachings. There were a lot of blessings. And I think that that's the part that we really need to really consider because I think that, again, to put it in context, these young, you know, I think to what Barry said, how can a man not want to be near such wonderful blessings in our communities? And sometimes uh, I will tell you the other side of that coin is I've worked with men who are incarcerated who feel that the best gift that they could give their kids was not to be around them because they felt that they were so damaged. And so we're dealing with these these very, very complicated, painful things that have gone on that we internalize and think it's us when in reality... It's institutional structures, it's history, it's oppression that have created this. And we have, even in our work, Andy, as you said, even when we buck the norm and say, hold on, you know what, um, you know, white movement, uh, I wasn't part of, because here's my thing, I wasn't part of the conversation when you all baked the cake. Um, I, I don't agree with that because that doesn't apply to me as a brown person or a black person or a native person or an Asian person. And the movement says, well, too bad, so sad, Candy. You're an outlier. We don't agree with you. This is the way the movement goes. Well, it doesn't include me. And my community feels about this very differently. We want to approach this very differently. And I want to talk about racism. Oh, Candy, how dare you bring that up? You're a woman. You should be pro what we do here. Well, no, hold on. I'm a black woman. Well, no, no, no. And I say that because that's happened to me in a lot of different movements. It happens to me in a lot of places where I work at, where they want solidarity upon an issue, but they don't want to create solidarity upon my color and about mm. the issues that pertain to my community. And I think that this is one of those areas where we we look at men and what we do and what we're trying to address, but we're trying to put it out of context in terms of the history and how we got to this place. And I think that masculinity as it's defined in the streets is also a result of what governments and history has done to our communities as well. Preach. Let me tell, let me just say, wow. And this is so true. I'm seeing the hands and the hearts and everything. That's so real. I just want to say two things. First off, for everyone, I did put in the comments, if you have a question or a comment, please put it in the chat and Krista will be monitoring it and bring that to the presenters. Um, you all had said some really deep things. I was doing a workshop with another organization here in Los Angeles, Be a Man, See a Man, and they have a all male program at Lock High School. And at one point I was in the class and there was a young man who came through the class. He was supposed to be there, but he couldn't be there. And he was coming in like once every blue moon. And I asked him, why aren't you here? He says, I've got to work. I said, well, what do you do? He told me that he was shooting dice. I said, what are you huh. doing to shoot dice? And, and is that a job? He's like, that's the only job I can get at 15 because he was a father of two right. and he was responsible for them. And there were so few resources for a father at 15, as if that doesn't ever happen. And again, this is all systemic. In our communities, our schools are looking like prisons. We don't have the resources and the tools with their jobs are not there. The transportation is kind of shoddy. Um, and there's just so many things that are, are problematic. So I thank you so much for bringing that into the conversation, Chico. Harry, I know you had something to say earlier. You know, I did, and, I, and I've, I've been listening and learning as well. And I think one of the things that we have to really, Chico, you talk about institutionalization. We cannot escape violence in America or around the world without incorporating colonization, 
and slavery and the historical impact um, that we have exposed our communities and our men to. So when you talk about engaging men to prevent violence, this is going to be an incredible lift because everything that we have been exposed to on how this country was founded and was taken over and was basically um, just monopolized on had to do with violence. We are in a, a pit of rewarding violence. We have, have television as rep representation of 60%. 60% of all programming has some form of violence associated with it because it sells and it sells very, very big. 40% of all programming has some form of heavy violence associated with it, uh, whether that be in terms of a murder or killing or just the act of basically um, of being exposed. So we have to basically look at, if we're going to engage men in preventing violence, we have to basically engage men in the behavior of what they value in terms of putting into their brains, in terms of their minds, what exactly they become, because we have basically become desensitized to violence. There is no big deal now when you see a Black man was shot and killed. <clears throat> Brown man was shot and killed. There is no, matter of fact, there are studies now to say that people will look at that and go through that news article or that television um, show or that news flash and they just move right on to the kitchen or move right on to the office at the home. So we have to really understand, when you start talking about engaging men, we have to first monitor and have discussions about where men get the impressions of violence being okay. And Terry, let me just say, if, if they're not paying attention to Black men, there's even less attention being paid to Black women and our children that are being abused, that are getting smacked in the face in front of other men, that are being shot and murdered just all the time. What do we do about this? And and I also want to just uplift one more thing. Abandonment is the very first question that I ask all of the people who come through our program. You know, who's in your family? I don't ask them about abandonment, but who is there in your family? Who is your resource? Who is the person that you can count on? And it's very seldom, I'm sorry to say, that there's fathers. And then a lot of times there's even mothers that are not, People don't feel connected to them for whatever reason, if they're in their home or not in their home. So let's have those conversations. Candy, I want to I want to go back because I got to, you know, you know me, I'm going to stay focused on what I've been called here for. And that's the subject matter of engaging men. And there is a big circle uh, in that particular conversation. I think targeting about what we want in our communities, what we want in our families, what we want in our relationships, we have to start there. And where we talk about domestic violence, we have to really ask ourselves, is this something within the family? Do we want within the community? Do we want within the relationship? Do we want how many couples dating, hooking up, whatever they may be, how many of them are talking about the issue of where do you stand on abusing a woman if you want to go there? Where is that conversation while you getting your grub on at the city club? Or why are you going to dinner? So if you are not having that conversation about the mannerism and the behavior of this man, you are really putting yourself at high risk <laughs> because it's that first conversation, that first invitation to the date that you better basically have your paper or your phone loaded with some questions. I don't care how fine you think he is or how he balling or what he got or who, what his problems are. You do not go into a conversation or an outing with a man without having questions about how that can impact your personal safety. Well, well, but let's be let's be honest. How many um, 
you know, folks date uh, a convict who was yep. um, inside for violent crimes. You know, how many folks date um, a molester or rapist, right? <laughs> because in some notion, that person, that individual believes they're either changed or they can help do what? Change that person. Yep. So in that reality, you know, though, I believe those factors as let's have the uh, uh, the, the 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 questionnaire for, for date night. Well, have you ever been in a domestic violent relationship? I mean, we all get triggered by different things. Right. I'm telling you right now, it takes a whole lot for any male because I love my sisters, I love my queens, but y'all got some spicy, spicy mouths at times when you go there. I see Crystal over there grinning right there. She's like, yeah, I know I do. That's why she's smiling. Like, I don't trust that a nigga last night. So here's my thing. When we as men give up that vulnerable part of us, and this is not the excuse, but I'm giving you guys some insight, and we're hearing the tone, we're hearing the aggression, we're hearing the, well, excuse me, we're feeling the challenge from someone that claims, I love you, I care about you, I got you. Uh, we're hearing that, we like, what the, that all, our instinct starts popping like, you just like everybody else. Now, we're not even looking at the approach that this is a woman, we're feeling betrayed, we're feeling lost, we have been so vulnerable to this person and now we're being, um, you know, we're being attacked in a way to where it could be warranted for whatever the conversation, but we believe that this was a safe space. And when we don't feel it's safe, what do we do? At 18 years old, they tell you could join what? Go join the military. You could be a killer, a legalized killer, right? When you sit in here in a, in, in a relationship and most men, because a lot of men, especially as they're younger, don't have, quote, unquote, all their stuff together. Let's say you're living with a girl. You can't just go and leave and get your own place. You looking like, damn, I'm stuck. So that feeling and the opposition of feeling stuck makes and triggers us to be in defense mechanism and defense mode. The problem that we have is that we don't find that accountability partner, that vent partner. And these are important things, important keys that I utilize in my life to be able to go air out whatever emotion or whatever feeling, whatever rage I have towards that person, especially a woman, to where it doesn't end up being something I regret. Because the, the consequences of the action of the abuse, yeah, you may have a person that may let you slide, but... So many men have I've watched. I saw a story that broke my heart. Um, it happened in the Bay Area, and I'm in Sacramento, so I'm about an hour and some change away from the Bay Area. This 24-year-old black girl uh, with a seven-year-old baby was killed at her job site because the father came in, out his mind, you know, they're not together anymore, came in, in her place of business, and killed her. Not only did he kill her, he got gunned down eventually by the police a few hours later. A seven-year-old son by the name of King has no parents now. How could that have been prevented if that young man had outlets, had a person he could trust? And when I talk about these vet partners, these accountability partners, they have to be trusted people that won't use your information and plaster you on some subliminal some message on social media. We'll tell the person down the street. We'll go pillow talk about, oh, this old weird ass nigga calling me crying about his girl. Someone you can be vulnerable. It's almost a therapist in a way. That young man, in a split second of whatever was going on in their relationship, felt, I am so out of control. And I can't control you no more that I'll take you out. We have to get to the point and in a part of, I understand all the background of why we're here, but we're here. How do we fix these issues with our men when they are triggered in that moment and they turn and do something that's catastrophic that affects all the community, not just that couple, but all the community. Yeah. You, you know, I, I, Thank you, Barry and Terry. Uh, I, I started my career 
almost 30 years ago doing reproductive health work with young men. Um, somebody figured out 30 years ago that that young men were involved in teen pregnancies. Figure that, right? Um, and I say that jokingly because at the time, 99% of the resources for teen pregnancy work, teen pregnancy prevention work, were targeting young women, as if young men were not involved in this process, right? Uh, that and older men too, because that, that was part of the equation. Um, and, and back then, one of the things that I would remind people is that if I was a teen father and I and I wanted to be a better father and a better male, where would you send me? Right. And the response back then was, got nothing. And if <laughs> I ask that question today, what do you got? Maybe a little bit. But my point being, we keep wanting young men and men to change but we're not creating spaces where we can do all of the things that Barry and Terry described. We want them to be better, but we can't even find the men like Barry and Terry and maybe myself and others that I work with who they can feel vulnerable with and be honest with and saying, let's, let's be, you know, as my, as my wife says, um, you know, I, I do this work, but she says, you know, you didn't come out of a box this way. Um, there was a lot of work that I had to do, even though I thought I was evolved. I was not. I was still very sexist. I was still very male. I, I was still all of these things that we're talking about, even though I hit it better. And, and, and I say all of that because I think until we create these venues for young men and older men um, to create space where where we can honestly be be talking about our problems and our issues and how we address them and learning, you know, I'm, I'm part of a community, a, a circle of men. Um, I, I've been married 27 years and I've been attending these groups for 27 years. And I tell people it's not a coincidence because it was the first time early on in my marriage where I sat in a room with men that would be, had been married 30, 40 years. And I actually heard a lot of what they were struggling with, and it gave me perspective. But I say that because, again, I go back to a historical context. What colonialism took from us, what oppression took from us, what racism, what it took from us was just the ability for men to meet and talk about our own expectations of each other. Because what that also involved is an aspect of protecting our community and protecting our families. You can't have that as a warrior. You can't have a bunch of men meeting to talk about these things. And what it did is it eroded really the expectations and it destroyed really what, what and who we really are. And I think that that's an important aspect of it where even today, as I, I go back to this, we don't have spaces where we can be vulnerable. We don't have spaces where we can talk about emotions, depression, all of these things that we struggle as human beings. And more importantly, we have not gotten to a place where we've erased the idea in our own communities that amongst men and amongst women, that that is acceptable. When I used to do this work and I would work in predominantly female dominated fields, I would tell everyone, I would, I would always, and I'll do, the, do that here. If you walked in, if, if you're in a relationship with a male, if, if, it's, a, if it's a partner or your father, or a, or a brother, and you walked into the house, and he was crying, what would you think? And the immediate response was, he lost his job, somebody died. It was always these extremes. It couldn't just be, I'm depressed, or I'm hurt. <laughs> it was always these extremes. So I, I say that because I think it's important for us to really begin to reconfigure our expectations. But also, again, recognizing that we have an absence of spaces for for young and old in terms of males to really begin to wrestle with some of these things that we contend with. Um, and in our agencies, again, are we creating those spaces? Are we creating opportunities? Uh, and again, I'm not talking about mental health, because even in mental health, I worked in mental health for 11 years, and it's supposed to be a place where you emote. But if you're black or brown and you emote in a male and you emote too much, guess, guess what? Security gets called. So even in those spaces, so even in those spaces where we're, where we're supposed to be able to emote, we Facts. frighten people when we emote too much. So Facts. I really think that there's there's something to that, and that we really need to talk about creating these spaces for for men to begin to uh, to normalize our own emotional release. 
Could you imagine a bunch of healed men? If there was a space for a bunch of healed men, like they don't want to invest in that. <laughs> Think about it. A space where there's a bunch of healed men to do the work that needs to be done. Black men, brown men, we're moving broken. And when we get out the womb, the target is on our back. And then life gets thrown at us. And then, of course, there are all these um, circumstances and responsibilities. And that doesn't negate what our Black women or brown sisters go through. But there's a special kind of um, distaste that America has for the Black and brown boys. There's a special certain kind of distaste. And I don't know it's because of uh, the, 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 our, cultural, our cultural aspect and how we stand or our, our bravado, how we assume confidence without even having as much as we should, but our survival mechanisms, our resilience. But there's a special kind of distaste that they make sure that they pause outlets because just now, we in the last few years, we've been talking about how mental health was a real thing. We just started talking about that when mental health should have always been a topic of a conversation a long time ago. Well, you know, I, I tell you, and here's three things. When you talk about violence, you talk about men, you got three things that have to be present. You have to have a threat. You have to have a fear. Or you have to have an insecurity. Any one of those three things will basically provoke an action by a man to induce violence or be a victim of violence. And one of the things when you start talking about engaging men, we have to really kind of put into perspective, Barry and uh, Mr. Rodriguez, what you were talking about in terms of having safe space. It's about being able to have men comprehend and young boys, what exactly is a threat? What is an insecurity and what is a fear? Awesome. And if you don't put those things in their proper perspective, I can tell you what, um, it's going to go off. And this is why you have stand your ground laws. This is why you have concealed carries. This is why you have situations in terms of um, defense attorneys that can basically uh, get you off uh, in a situation where you just have to show that you are threatened, you fear, you have an insecurity. And that may justify exactly why you behave the way you behave. And when you talk about society, the greater society, you, you, you talk about someone who is willing to put harm on our elders because they may be pulling a basket with them or going from the grocery store or going to their car. Um, somebody wants something from you, but it's because of some of those other things that are present. You know, will I be able to get a job to, follow, to, to afford a car or do I just take? And I think one of the things we have to look at in these safe spaces that you all are talking about, and I think you're absolutely right. But in those safe spaces and in those healing circles, um, we have got some major work to do um, before a man gets to or a male becomes a legal age of, of being a man. Um, we are not reaching these young people fast enough, effectively enough, so that they can actually have some good critical thinking as well as coping skills um, to sustain. And I think this is probably when we start talking about engaging. And you're right, Barry, the, the worst thing that can happen in America, which is the best thing that happened in America, uh, is for us to basically not harm each other. Man. Because that right there unfortunately, doesn't pay dividends to, big to Wall Street. <laughs> Talk to them. So before we go farther, and I know you all have a lot of conversation, we want to hear more from Chuko, Barry, and Terry, but we have two um, guests that have questions or comments. So uh, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to say for our guests, <laughs> we have a limited amount of time. And not to say that you do this, but there are some people that come and hijack a conversation. You give them a minute and they take 10. So if we could pose our question and or a comment in a minute and let our guests um, answer them, uh, I'd like to do that. I'm going to also actually give Mr. Cortez Chandler uh, just a little bit longer because he put a link 
in the comments section. I just checked it out. It looks amazing. Um, so Mr. Cortez and then Dr. Farah, I'm not going to pronounce your last name because I, I will murder it. And I'm trying to be respectful of people's names. So Mr. Cortez, if you could have a minute, minute and a half, no more than two, I would appreciate it. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I'm, I work for the Timeless Group. Uh, we were formerly incarcerated. So I created this games program while I was incarcerated in prison. It's called Giving All Men Emotional Strength because a lot of times we don't know how to express our emotions. We don't know how to share with fellow men and women. So we even got a Dad's Back program that's actually helping people get an understanding about your emotions because a lot of times women don't see that. I mean, I'm married. I got married the day I walked out of the system because I had a plan. But at the same time, when I got home, I, I don't know this person. You know, I know who she is. I love her, I, everything. But everyday things, I don't know, you know, because I was gone for 24 years. I didn't know how to relate. I knew was how to get something, like you was talking about earlier. I didn't know how to relate to a woman. So I had to learn that. And by learning that, I had to be able to give it to somebody else because it, frustration. You know, when he was talking about people going on through emotions, you have to be able to grasp that and have an understanding about how to give it out, okay? But now I sit there, I, I, I always told people, I know how to fight, a, I, I know how to fight a man all day, but I don't know how to fight with a woman because them words hurt. <laughs> you know, people talk about a lot of things, but that hurts. So having the strength to even see that and find out and connect emotionally, we can do that. Did I do it in enough time? I tried to be fast. You did. Thank you so much. I'm going to ask everyone to um, check out his link, download it, because it looks phenomenal. I thank you so much for joining us. Dr. Farah, I'm going to let you come on, and then we're going to go um, directly over to um, Chuko, because I know he has to leave soon. So go ahead, um, Dr. Farah. Hi, Candy. Thank you. Um, it's a great conversation to have. Uh, my name is Dr. Farah. I am a clinical psychologist for Hoppics, which is a large um, nonprofit community for provider within Swastics. Um, And we are embarking on opening up a program called the Homeless Treatment Program. Um, actually, it's already started. We're getting new people. And we used to have a program um, called the Women's Treatment Program that assisted unaccompanied women um, who were homeless and had some substance abuse um, in their past or currently, um, different degrees, whatever. But now we are opening up that to men. And within that program, we have mental health therapists available. We have um, for individual therapy, our, uh, we host um, what's called trim groups. So they will be designed specifically for men to address trauma. And there's a curriculum in that. We have um, case managers and a substance abuse counselor. But how do we engage and get men to want to participate? Um, in such a program like this. It's here for all the reasons you oh, yeah. have stated, but we don't know how to engage them. There are going to be separate groups for men and women, um, and we're trying to get male staff to conduct those, but how do we get them invested? And we go to our shelters um, and stuff like that within the HOPIC system, so we do have targeted participants, but we are interested in bringing others and even those within our programs, how do we get them to want to participate and invest in this for them as they're in shelters and interim housing, have been abusers and abused, substance abuse issues. We just don't know how to get them on board. So any tips, I would love to, you know, connect with each of you um, to get more information to have this successful for the men in our system, mostly Black and Black. Thank you. Well, thank you so uh, much. Chuko, I know Chuko was, 
Who, I'm sorry. I think he was getting ready to leave. No, no actually, actually, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stick. I'll, I'll be, I'll be staying. I moved my my schedule. I wanted to stick around. So, man, it's that good uh, to uh, you, huh? I appreciate you. Yes, sir. <laughs> um, I think go, that. Go ahead, because I, I have some thoughts too, though. Yeah. Um, I think that this is a this is where we have to understand when we try to process these 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 spaces for men. You didn't help me when I really needed the help. Why are you trying to help me now? Some men are looking like, well, is this a trap, right? And, and so we have to look at these mechanisms that all of a sudden end up saying we are here to help, where most of the things, when we talk about the rehabilitation centers, what are those? Those are prison systems. Those are supposed to what? Rehabilitate men. Are they rehabilitating our men? No. You have to really go in there with a mindset, I am going to be rehabilitated. And even in that mindset, there's everything that you thought you weren't going to have to deal with in the streets right there. I just walked the yard a couple of weeks ago with, with some soldiers, and I really saw how desperate some of those men need what you're talking about, good doctor. But the reality is, for us men, we have to feel like it's a safe space. It's a trusted space. And who are these people that I can connect with? The one thing that, and a lot of the reasons why in going into our school, a lot of our kids fail in school, okay. black and brown, we don't have people that look like us. And even if we have people that look like us, some of them are compromised. Some of them have conformed. They don't speak from what I know or what I feel. The reason why I'm so good at the things that I do with my young people, I'm from the culture. I'm from the core. I'm cemented from what they used to be and what they could be. So I've been able to still be fluid in my maturity, but still be at their level to where they know, oh, no, we're not playing no game because it's unk. But at the same time, I'm able to talk their language. I'm able to understand and um, be compassionate about where they're at. I think that um, you got to make sure the members, the team folk that you have, um, opening up these spaces, they have some 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 track record. They they know you may have to have someone that has dealt with um, um, domestic violence um, that has been reformed, and that's another key thing. A lot of people don't want to see the reformed man that was once upon a time an abuser. That's very tricky, right? Some folks will think like he can never change, right? So we have to give grace into a person's past. But I really do think that being familiar with faces and stories, and it's just not all book orientated. I got my master degrees. I've read all these books, so I know how to, you know, help you out. Nah, you got to have to have real skin in the game, right? And we have to also know that this space is really a safe space. And it is here not to just check off the box, but it is here to help me heal and to get me right. You know, you know, um, and Dr. Fair, I think, I think this. Carrie, let it, me just jump in real quick and just say this: it's true. We just had this conversation yesterday about how are you authentic in your walk and your talk, or are you now someone else and not acknowledging your past? And and then this work that we do, we engage men and boys that have been victimized as well as those who have been abusers because they have healed. And that's the key thing. You know, don't just go get somebody off the street and because they have a story or they have the truth, but they have to have, they have to heal and they also have to still be relatable, yeah. you know, and, and that's real true. I'm going to um, let you speak, Terry, and then I have a question that's in the chat that I want to bring up. And uh, Kuko, be sure to jump in here. And, and, and Dr. Fair, I think you're talking about how do you attract this population that you're trying to do some things with. Number one, it's going to be language. And you got to have the right language uh, in order to connect with them. Um, the other thing, too, and I think Cortez talked about this, he, you know, he could find a man all day. But when women start talking, you know, you, you know, <laughs> it hurts. And so you got to really get a chance to make sure that your collateral material. What exactly is it that you're using and how is it representing that particular um, population that you're trying to pull to what you're trying to engage them with? That becomes very key. 
The other thing too, um, you're going to have to really understand your authenticity, or you're going to have to have some empathy. Uh, what exactly do you relate to? How do you comprehend um, what exactly are the buzzwords that are being used within the circles that you're trying to uh, attract? And the other thing, too, you're going to uh, have to make sure that what you're offering, you know, what's your hook? You know, what exactly is it that you bring into their game that wants them to come eat at your table? Because if you ain't serving up the right meal, you know, you just got a, you know, you, you just got a food truck that's just got some gas in it, uh, but ain't nothing going out the window. And so, you know, you have to really make sure that you, you got a hook. But what exactly is the uh, uh, the attraction for them to engage in the conversation? And so what are you offering them? That means you may have to invest in something and then you have to know what exactly to invest in. Uh, to get their attention. But those are some of the things that I would say uh, are going to be key. And then the authenticity uh, with regards to um, do they feel, and this is very important, I think, with regards to when you engage men, do they feel they have a long-term relationship with you or is it going to be a one and done? Yeah, I, and I would, you, Dr. Ma. Parra, I, I, I would add really quick, I, you know, I think that the idea of peer to peers is is really critical. I, I you know, um, having credible messengers for the population that you're working with, in partnership with your work, um, especially around mental health support. These are, you know, let's let's be really clear. What I didn't state earlier is that our our system in terms of 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 social services is not designed for men. It's designed for women and children, Awful. and so it's a very frightening. It's a very frightening system for men. And so as a consequence, I think that you need credible messengers to help. I used to work in mental health. A lot of my work was really bridging communities of color to trust mental health systems and also demystify a lot of perceptions that were not true about mental health um, and, and people of color around immigration status, around parents, around all these different things, right? Um, and so I think having credible messengers is a really important part of it. Um, in terms of the engagement piece, in terms of the retention piece, that's a separate separate issue. Um, you know, there's a fundamental notion that I always ascribe to, which is, if you want people to give up a particular behavior, um, you have to give them something to replace it with of equal or greater value to them, not to me, but to them. And I think that that is, you know, I think I I really firmly believe that the creation of safe space for people, people inherently want that. Um, we cannot imagine, I think a lot of us cannot imagine a, a life um, because we because we we're so used to it, is that we have a pay, a place where we can go and we feel safe. Um, but but imagine imagine a life where you don't have that, where you can't just be just release and just be safe in 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 in, in its totality. And I think that inherently that's that's one of the areas that I found young and old in terms of males, that when you create that and it's really based on relationship, um, that that I think th that people begin to realize that this is something that they want, there's something that they need and they go to. The other thing sounds very, very simple, but I'll tell you, I started a group 25 years ago. They meet uh, every first Wednesday of the month in, you know, neighboring community, uh, Wednesdays from six to eight. Uh, guess what time they still meet? Wednesdays, six to eight, first of the month. Uh, because even when people drift away, at some point they find themselves like, I really need this. I wonder if it's still there. And they know that it's a consistency because we have such inconsistency in our life. Sounds very, very simple, but it also creates some consistency for people sometimes that you can always say, you can come back whenever you want. The door is always open, so. Thank you so much. Uh, we have about 24 minutes, 26 minutes left. Actually, 24 minutes left in this conversation. These conversations go so quickly and they're so important and so impactful. I want to make, I want to ask the gentleman um, on camera if you all will come back for another conversation because we're only touching the tip of this. Yeah, just say, yeah, yeah, yeah. I already told you to bring me down. I already told you to get me down to L.A. Stop playing with me, young lady. I okay, already told so you maybe we'll one. do something live with you all. <laughs> yeah, let's I get it live, that. live yes. and direct. Let's get to it.
Yes. Okay. So now I want to um, bring some conversation. I'm going to ask the first three questions and then I'm going to have Crystal come on. Well, the first three questions are from, of course, Ms. Bernita Walker uh, herself. And Ms. Bernita Walker, if you all do not know, is the queen in Los Angeles uh, with Project Peacemakers and does a fabulous 40-hour domestic violence uh, awareness. She also do anger management. There's so many things that she does. And I'm going to, um, Bernita, go ahead and ask your three questions. But Bernita, I'm going to tell you too. Keep it at a minute. Or do I need to go? I have them right here. This. I put it in there so that I would not talk. But I'll just say this, and then Candy's going to ask you the question. Either Chris is going to ask you one or the other. Thank you so much. I'm on men all the time. My husband gets mad at me because I'm always talking about the same thing you're talking about. Uh, I believe in lived experience and that it needs to be taught because you know how to talk to the young men, the young males that want to be men, that think they're men, that they're not men. So I thank you again and again for your information, and I look forward to seeing you again. Good to see you, Terry. I, I saw you, Bernita. I just didn't get a chance to get in there, but okay. I'm, I'm so, I saw you. All right. Okay, so go ahead. Ask the questions. Okay, so Bernita asked three questions. I'm going to ask these three together. Are we teaching the foundations that you are bringing forth? Um, additionally... The next question is, and how do we get you to um, to the teachers, especially in schools, such as coaches to academics and share this information? Oh, Bernina, I think those two right there are going to be the questions that I put forth and we'll have Crystal come up. So how do we get these foundations and how do we get them to the school? I'm going to just put in here, let me just say, I was having a conversation with my husband um, that it's difficult to get these conversations to schools because they have so many other issues that <laughs> to even try and, and bring this to the class itself when they're dealing with the mental health, when they're dealing with the trauma, when they're dealing with not having the resources and the tools and the kids showing up late and them being hungry and angry. But all of that is... Conversation? All of that is a part of the issue, because if we address the issue that we're talking about, we wouldn't have that because it wouldn't true. be in play. OK, I'm going to be quiet. I, I, uh, I, I, and I, and I can speak. Oh. I, was so saying, I can speak to the foundation, the, the philanthropy piece of it, because that's kind of where I where I where I'm situated as a philanthropic organization. But but I think that that that's a very good question. And I think that philanthropy is in a unique position right now where they're beginning to grapple. I mean, I I worked in the equity space for a long time and I tell people and I remind philanthropy, just so we're clear, three years ago, you were not at the same place that we are at now around equity conversations. You didn't care about black and brown people. Some of you all did, but philanthropy as a whole did not want to talk about racism and equity and institutional racism and oppression and colonization. Now they do. But I want to be clear about that, because that also implies <laughs> that they have to shift considerably what and how they support the work and what they're assessing. And, you know, fundamentally, I, mean, I think from a philanthropic standpoint, when philanthropy ignores one of the biggest factors that affects the success or failure of interventions in, in black and brown communities, which is racism, that's poor planning. That's really poor investments because they want to address everything else, but not a critical piece of what's affecting how we succeed or fail or what's affecting our community. So what I would urge folks on this call is that you push philanthropy to recognize these fundamental realities of our communities and black and brown communities specifically that have to do with racism and that also challenge the notion that, you know, it has to be a traditional way. I think one of the points you brought up is how, how are we compensating and integrating the community is people with lived experience to help in this work. Now, I, I here's here's the here's the issue is that I think it's important, and I think Terry and and Barry talked about this in a healthy way. People that are healed, people that have addressed their trauma, that have con to contribute, who have walked the walk, and you know, as my elder says, have crossed that bridge and have come back and are able to go back and forth without getting stuck. And by that, I mean it, it, to addiction, violence, all of these things. And, and I think that it, it, it is really upon us and coming upon us to challenge 
philanthropy and foundations to support these other alternatives. Because at the end of the day, let's be really clear, a lot of what philanthropy has invested in terms of su successfully solving problems in our communities hasn't worked. Because if it had, we wouldn't be having this conversation. So let's let's get creative. Let's get innovative. Let's really engage communities in looking at different ways of doing this. But a lot of it really is upon us to challenge uh, foundations and other funders to 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 invest in innovative ways and invest in communities. You know, foundations expect collaboration, but they've never invested in collaboration, and we need to remind them of that. Ooh, brother. Um. I definitely believe that there's there's a lot of things into play. I just don't think that folks are ready for the untraditional ways of doing things. I'm the type of individual that folks say role model. I say real model. I don't play a role. I'm a real model. I'm flawed. I'm imperfect. So what you see is what you get. Role models is like Tiger Woods. You play a role, you figure out that he's not even the real role model that you were looking for. You know, And I think that when these folks see people coming off the hinges on how we work with our kids. The truth is that when people see us working with our kids, it takes them back because that wasn't a part of what they went to school for. That wasn't a part of the educational plan. Right. And I, and I feel that oftentimes we um, get the lack there of funding because again, cleaning up, a whole bunch of black and brown boys to make them better, to have them successful, to make sure that they're not part of the status quo, it, 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 it puts the system back a few spaces. So it's okay for them to have, uh, you know, the suspension rate high, the expulsion rate high, because at the end of the day, there's going to be another body to replace that body, right? Because our kids is only numbers and dollar senses, a dollar sign to them in true reality. So one kid lose, we'll go find another kid. So I, I really believe that the people, the, a lot of the, and I'm going to say it, a lot of the black and brown gatekeepers keep us away from doing the intentional work that we should be doing. I'm going to say this again. A lot of the black and brown gatekeepers keep us away from the work we could be doing, and it's intentional. They'll come up with all the wordplay. They'll come up with all the strategy. They'll even partner and collaborate. But eventually, when you don't fit the norm of what they're trying to portray and doing it in a way they feel is not going to piss off the status quo or the system is going to push back, then they'll isolate you. They'll take your information, your ingenuity, your uh, you know thought patterns of how to do certain things, but they'll um, sugarcoat it, they'll water it down, and they'll kind of come across it in a whole different lens. So a lot of, I think, the power play it's not necessarily only the system, but it's when we get in the system, there are too many black and brown gatekeepers that continue to maintain the status quo. I've had to deal with that a lot here in Sacramento, right? If you don't play ball, kiss the ring or kiss ass, then you're going to have a, a, a long term effects of getting funding and getting support or getting into certain spaces because you piss somebody off because you are more intentional about getting the job done in a different way in effect that they have done it and it's not really worked. I'm going to come in and uh, Adrian Spires um, asked, are systems and institutions willing to compensate black and brown staff to lend their lived experiences and professional experience? Anyone can jump in on that question. Let's bring Juco in as the foundation. I, and let me just say this, um, Positive Brazil Center is honored to be sponsored by the Hope and Heal Fund. They do amazing work. And if you all are not familiar with them, please make sure that you check them out. Juco. Thank you, Candy. Okay. I, you know, I think that, that foundations are moving in that direction. I think I, I worked in mental health and, you know, here's, <laughs> here's the interesting part, just a little history for folks to, if you didn't realize, you know, we have a whole, in mental health, we have a whole category, a, a profession, a professional category that's called paraprofessionals. And the history of para, paraprofessional work in this country is that that was created for people of color. The paraprofessional, that profession, because 
because at the time in the 70s and 80s, there was a challenge, a difficulty reaching people of color. What ended up happening is that the beneficiaries of paraprofessional work ended up being poor white people who didn't have degrees, who took over that profession. Now, I say that because there's always been kind of it, it, the, the, the this opportunity for people with lived experience in this country and it started in the 70s for people of color but it got appropriated by by poor whites uh and again i'm not i'm not trying to cast blame what i'm saying is that this sounds like a new thing and it's not it, it it's been in it's been in practice for a very long time um and i think that it, it, there's certain organizations uh in, in you know i worked in mental health and mental health with the mental health services act that is a common practice to hire people with lived experience in mental health work. Uh, it just hasn't been afforded to people of color as much as it has to white consumers. And so there's a lot of, there's a lot of, in different systems, there's already perf a lot of examples of hiring people with lived experience. But again, what we're seeing is the same example of discrimination and lack of inclusion of people of color in those arenas. And so I think that we need to continue to push more and more so that we put value on the experience that we're big, you know, that we're bringing in. And again, I go back to this to hold institutions and foundations accountable when when foundations say we're all about equity. OK, well, what does that look like? Because to oh. me, what equity looks like is that you put value on the cultural competency and the multilingual, multicultural experiences that people bring, because what's important in working in our communities is the relationship that we have and not basically, as, as Barry said, the degree that I bring to the table. What makes me connected to the community is the language, the culture, the experience that I have, and, and more, more importantly, the connection that I have to the community. Those are very valuable assets that we need to account for and not necessarily whether or not you know, I have a degree or I graduated. Uh, I think those are the things that are valuable and we need to begin to challenge that. But again, I urge people to also look at other systems within your own communities and figure out where they are hiring people with lived experience, but but not necessarily black or brown people. Ooh, say that. And one of the other concerns about hiring people with lived experience is they don't value it. So they want to pay them pennies on the dollar. Let me just say that, because that's a shame. That's a damn shame. Crystal, before you ask the next question, let me bring in Mr. Ross, who's been very patient. He had his hand up. I'm going to also remind everyone to please put your comments in the chat and also check out the beautiful information and resources that are in the chats from the flyers to the links. Um, it's just amazing. Thank you all. Mr. Ross? Yes, uh, I want to say this is a wonderful conversation. I'm so glad I got to listen to all you guys. You guys are immaculate. Um, what we're doing right now, while well, I'm a teacher in Monrovia Unified, I'm a South LA baby, you know, 3994 South Hillcrest Drive, apartment B, 9008. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> um, so the situation is we're getting live, we're getting credible messengers in there. So I have proof of concept with peer support specialists. So what happens is my master's in special education, I was just as impacted as a youth. But I found out that I like women more than I like men, and I don't want to be locked up with these guys. You know 100%. what I'm saying? So, so that's just real. So I'm also a father with four sons, and all of my sons, I'm, I'm still with my wife. I got all four babies, and I only have all boys. So the fact of the matter is, when we get the lived experience in there, we can infiltrate the school systems because Frederick Douglass said it's easier to mold men than it is to mend them. So if I get them when they're young. I can get lived experience people in there as instructional aides because those are the ones where most of our boys who have just really boy tendencies, right? Um, they get diagnosed with ADHD, other health impairment, certain situation, you know, myself. Okay, that's fine. So when I get the lived experience people in there because of the Fair Chance Act, as long as they didn't have a late night sneaky uncle, <laughs> you know, case, I can get them in there and then their lived experience because YA is coming, they're being retrofitted, and I'm getting all these boys from YA that are coming back home, and there's nobody that's a credible messenger. So once again, just to be concise, there are situations and processes in place where I can turn instructional aides into peer support specialists. It's financially and fiscally advantageous for school districts to hire them because they can charge back some of those $75 per 15 minutes for the therapeutic activities 
the collateral situations. And that's how I'm getting young men of color who may not be have a college degree, but they have lived experience and I can get them. It is easier to guide somebody to the process of, 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 of success based on remembrance versus imagination. I don't have to imagine where you've been. I can remember the pathway and I can guide you back. So if anybody, I put my number in there. We just did it right now. I got y'all. I'm like, Mr. Barry, my hands work. My students know my hands work. And I'm the only one of us that got bail money. They know what it is. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I miss my cousins anyway. I'll be back home. You know what I mean? But I love them because I tell my, my, my teachers and all the men of color, if you get compensated for sacrifice, then it wasn't a sacrifice at all. You can't get compensated for sacrifice. That, that, that That's an exchange. So I'm with these young men. I'm at East Lake 203. I'm at CYA when they get released. I'm at Barry J. So if we can get these people, I can get people hired as peer support specialists, and then the school systems will hire them and then the school system can build Medi-Cal for the therapeutic activities that these young men are doing. That's all I got. That was too long. I'm sorry. No, that, no, was, that was perfect. No, that, was, that, was, that was beautiful. That was, Just uh, check, and, the, and, check and, the comment. And, and, and the thing about it, King, real talk, that's when you hear that passion in your voice, you hear the residue of who you were before, but who you continue to be in that growth. That's what resonates with our kids. Our kids don't want to hear uh, a nigga who walking around here, now you're perfect. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Like, oh, you 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 done made it. Cool. But I'm still in the trenches. They want to hear authentic voices, as I said, credible messengers, you know, but you're showing what manhood looks like in every way from marriage to fatherhood to another component in manhood of just walking the line and doing work that a lot of people, a lot of our black men, the reason why they don't want to go be teachers is not because they can't be teachers, it's because it's not paying them enough. So that is to be commended. I I, I shot you my line. Let's build. Um, it's 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 just it's just refreshing when you hear folks that are from the soil that are coming back to give back because we have to be the ones to be the tools and the and the the devices to change what's going on because they're not going to take it from um, folks that don't have the necessary lived experiences and appreciate the fact that we survived it. I'm not telling anybody to go the pathway I did. I got lucky. A lot of our kids are not becoming lucky. Like a lot of our kids are getting so sucked in and wrapped in. And that same thing you talked about, I told my kids all the time, I don't know what y'all look like in, in juvenile hall, jail, prison, because I did a juvenile hall stint and I ain't never went to jail prison because I said, you know what? That's keeping me from the things that I love. And we have to be real like that. So salute you, brother. I appreciate you. Um, so we actually have five minutes left to this conversation. Why we can't have four hour Zooms, y'all? Because, because you didn't book it. That's what I'm because you didn't book it. <laughs> Look, I'm sorry. We're gonna have this, we're gonna have this real talk in-person conversation. Most of you know. We host a conference called Promoting Healthy Manhood. I might switch it a little bit by um, just having a whole day of dialogue with some men because you all are all kind of fire. And Mr. Ross, everybody is blowing you up. If you are not seeing these notes, like everybody wants to meet you. Um, real quick, we are going to, We this conversation has been recorded. Uh, we will download it. We will upload it to our YouTube page and we will send you a link. We would like you to not only watch it again, but share it with everybody you know, because this conversation is fire and the resources are amazing. Um, we now have four minutes left. Crystal asks one last question. And then I'd like to leave the last few minutes for the gentlemen um, to give their final thoughts and comments. And I just, again, want to say thank you all for taking the time to be with us today. Please make sure you put your resources uh, in the comments so that we can follow up with you. We're doing a resource guide uh, and we also have events. We like to invite you to everything that we do. Thank you all. So. Um, Let's go back in alphabetical order, and you all have two minutes each. You there want me to ask ahead. this question? Oh, oh yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm sorry. First. Go ahead, Chris. Okay, I have one more. It was earlier um, in the conversation, but um, 
I hope I'm not pronouncing this wrong. Maya Jackson or Mia Jackson said, if Maya the Jackson. system, Maya Jackson, if the system hasn't changed, then how do we prevent violence? It seems though, it seems as though this will be a never ending cycle. And we see it's getting worse with the influence of social media, music videos, movies, continue system issues, et cetera. Whoever wants to jump in. That's deep. You, you know, I, I mean, really quick, I, I think that we continue to look at systems that have oppressed us to solve this. That is not going to happen. We need to solve our own problems. Um, we keep looking at, you know, and, and I think that that's part of it. I work in the gun violence field and I tell people, if you expect guns to stop coming into the community, that's not going to happen. And that's a different problem that we need to solve. But but my focus is why is it that we're not working on working with males to address the issue why we have so normalized in our community that the way that we resolve violence or conflict is to take our own life or the life of others. That is the problem. And, and that has nothing to do. That's stuff that we have to solve that other people are not going to solve. And I think that at the center of this conversation is how do we fix ourselves? How do we fix our communities? and rely on a lot of the cultural assets that exist in our communities. African-American communities have, have, have been resilient over 500 years of oppression, and it's not due to external systems of social welfare. We were not included in those. Latino communities, Native communities, we have our own sense of resiliency, but now we're looking at these systems that have oppressed us to solve the problem for us. Let's be clear, they created this issue. So the only solution that I say is that we have to solve our own issues in our own communities. We have to rely on ourselves. And yes, we have to figure out how to fund this with those resources, but in a way that appeals to us, not in a way that damages us further. And I think that that's the important part. Systems are not going to change. Um, it's very challenging. Um, and I'm not, again, I'm not saying that we're not making some inroads in those areas, but, but, and there's some opportunities that we can take advantage, but at the end of the day, ultimately, who is going to fix our communities absent those systems or whether they change or not, it has to be us. Um, and I'm going with what my brother said. It has to be us. Um, I'm very disappointed um, at us. And I say that because there was a big movement that was going around and it wasn't articulated correctly, but it was the idea of defunding the police. Some, the opposition, those who weren't in their right mind, were uh, abolish. I understand that. But in reality, those who were in the right mind were really saying divest and invest. So may, basically saying, take away some of this large hundred millions. I don't know how much you guys got here in L.A., but I think we're like at $200 million that law enforcement gets, right? Take some of those dollars, start reinvesting it and community-led services, right? We're talking about mental health responses. We're talking about homeless responses. We're talking about, um, you know, uh, dealing with juveniles in a certain perspective. You know, let's take away some of the responsibility from law enforcement. But the whole idea that everybody bought into was you guys want to get rid of the police. And some of that people pushed the narrative. Now, in this idea of a lot of, um, you know, cities uh, in California, and just throughout the nation have kind of done this play to eradicate something that they've done before because it's they, they they like to go back in the past is what are people going to start asking because there's lawlessness everywhere right now right so in a sense of when we're talking about community policing if we were talking about defunding police then it would be on us to commute to do our policing in our community if we were to do that, if it was on us, and if this was kind of our preview, we're doing a horrible job, right? And at the same time, what they're going to end up doing, because now everyone is asking for this lawlessness to stop, you're going to get more what? You're going to get more law from the same system that you said we must defund. The problem is we are not ready, again, the two words that I'll bring back, accountability and responsibility. We are not ready to get our hands fully dirty. Because what some people, I don't think, don't understand, they don't mirror the idea of even if we got rid of law enforcement as it is today, we would still have to deal with Jobo the molester. We would still have to deal with 
Kathy, the prostitute. We would still have to figure out services and consequences for activities in our community. And I think some people just really believe that we get rid of the police, they'll stop over-policing us, and that everybody will wake up and it'll be harmony. And that's so far from the truth. We have to have the ability to reenact what the Panthers did when they were policing our community because of the police violence. And until we get to that point to where we're ready, accountability, responsibility, to really engage in structures that are really be transparent, as well as check, as well as give consequences when people are doing wrong and have a code of conduct that our community does not have right now, we're going to continue to be stuck in a situation where we say defund, they're going to laugh at us because it's like, well, what are you guys doing in your own communities? And let's be very clear. Black people don't have communities. Why? Because if it was our community, we would be owning a lot more in our communities. We are just literally guests in an area that is um, populated by Black people, but not owned by Black people. Gary? Well, I tell you, I just think that um, the biggest thing we can do is keep the conversation going. And I put that flyer, Candy, that you put out, to challenge everyone that is listening, that's on here, don't let the flyer die. Continue circulating this particular flyer by PRC, asking the question, how do we engage men to prevent violence? Uh, it would be a travesty that we would let the conversation die. And I think we have to ask individuals to ask men in your own family, how do we do this? And I think you have to give some feedback. And what I would like to challenge everyone to do is to circulate the flyer, asking the question, and then provide PRC feedback so it can be equipped and better prepared to come back and continue the courageous conversation. But don't let this conversation die because if you want to truly engage men to prevent violence, don't just be a one and done. Make it a part of your family culture. Make it a part of your community. Make it a part of your circle that we want to make sure that we intercept violence before it strikes us at home. And the only way you're going to do that is to circulate and talk about it. Wow. Wow, wow. Uh, I just want to say thank you all. Can we give them a round of applause? Clap it up, scream it up, holler it up, turn on your mics, do the hands, whatever it is, because this was a amazing conversation and you're absolutely right. Every okay. single point that was brought up, um, it was Amen. it was um, phenomenal. Yep, man, Bernita, man is right. Terry, thank yeah. you so much for lifting up that flyer because we need to engage everyone to understand how do we prevent violence and how do we engage men? Um, I can honestly say this when, uh, and, and I know Bernita can see because she's been a witness to it, that not only I, uh, other organizations, her organization, but when I first started in this business and I started engaging boys and men, I was ostracized by a lot of organizations that focused on domestic violence. And I just didn't understand it, y'all. That's my grandson in the background. He's good. He's cool. Um, but how do we how do we prevent it if we're not engaging those that have the biggest impact in it? And I just want to say I want to thank you all for your time. I know many of you have to go. We will be sending links to this conversation to, uh, uh, to our YouTube page. So when you are sharing the flyer, share the video. And we will be bringing the gentleman back, including Mr. Ross, to have follow-up conversation. And yes, some of it will be in person. That is guaranteed. I just want to uplift a few things that I heard. Not only that, don't forget to check all of the links in the website or in the chat. Um, children will forgive. Children will forgive everything that you've done to them as long as you give them a chance. Abandonment is key to all forms of violence. Everyone that has dealt with any type of violence will tell you that they've been abandoned. So we need to figure that out. Safe spaces and trusted spaces are critical. 
Our foundations need to invest in our community in the way that we need them. So we need to get more funders on this um, in these Zooms and also talk to those that are funding you. Make sure that they know what your needs are because what they need is for you to be successful. And you can't be successful if you're not meeting the needs of your community. There's so much more um, violence is prevalent in our communities. Rewatch this conversation. Barry, Kuko, and Terry, please, thank you so much. I want to just really, again, thank you for taking the time to participate and lend your expertise, lend your knowledge, and your lived experience to this conversation. For everyone who has joined this call, we appreciate you. And follow us, contact us, as Terry said, contact us and let us know uh, what you're thinking and how do we prevent, um, engage, how do we engage men to prevent violence? Thank you all so much. Appreciate y'all. Thank, Thank you. Bless. Blessings. Well, I don't want to end this call. Really, I don't. But we have to. Well, because you because you made us end the call. That's that's the thing. You didn't sit there. <laughs> you already know. You already know what we was gonna do. You should have been. I'm like, excited. Right, let me get this five o'clock.